Good morning, y'all. It's Good Tuesday buddy. morning, 11 o'clock. I'm CJ. There's Mike, and we have a special guest today. Miss, I just got to point the right way. Ducey <laughs> Gomez. <laughs> So how, I hope everybody had a good weekend. Um, I've been fighting a cold. Finally broke through. Been on antibiotics since Tuesday or Wednesday. I think it was Wednesday. But finally broke through it on Saturday. It's not been easy. Meanwhile, Mr. Mike. Got a little bit of a cold. Not COVID, though, so don't, don't worry. So, just that, <laughs> traditional allergies. Lord willing, no, that's it, but yeah. Yeah. But every time somebody sneezes or coughs anymore, it's just like, oh, you have COVID. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. it's just a cold, honestly. We live in Texas, like East Texas, which is like Allergy Central USA. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's you how see, we roll. Isn't that funny? You sneeze and everyone starts running for the hills around you. <laughs> it's like, you know, prior to 2020, nobody yeah. in the world ever had a cold or the flu. It's yeah. just, I mean, and don't get me wrong. COVID is bad, but right. not everything is COVID. And so it gets a little frustrating on our ends. <laughs> but, you know. Anyway, welcome, Miss DC. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me, both of you. How are you guys? Now that you're semi better, I think that's exciting. <laughs> yes. Mr. Lee, where you three is here this morning. He says <clears throat> hello and good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, DC, you write something that's different than both Mike and I write. You write this apocalyptic sort of thing with a really funky sense of humor. That's, all, that's how I describe it. <laughs> Can you tell those who are listening and watching what it is you write, how you write it? And we'll go from there. So most people know me for urban fantasy. I do tons of urban fantasy. This year, I want to say at the beginning of January, this crazy idea came to mind for dystopia. I've never done dystopia. The concept, I'm like, what does that mean? So it literally was this crazy idea that popped into my head of a girl sitting in Texas in her backyard sunbathing while her cat is trying to maneuver zombies to cut this lawn. Really, that's kind of the premise of this entire, how this story came about. I actually got a call that same day for a dystopian anthology. And I was like, oh my God. Seriously? Okay, this is how yeah, it was bad within like six hours of each other. I was like, oh, that's where the idea is coming from. Because I had no intention of doing anything with it. I like the idea of this crazy little cat with an attitude who happened to be telling zombies what to do. Mm -hmm. As I play with the concept, my brother pretty much pointed out that I have a necromancer cat. Not something I was aiming for. But dystopian is a lot interesting because it's almost, you know, you have alternative history. You have all these different things you can do. But thinking of what will happen if the world ended and why and how did you pick it up? So you started this story literally after a war between witches and humans, and now the humans need some help from the witch. So it is her journey, because she's curious and bored, <laughs> to figure it out why do the humans want this child and what can they possibly want? So pretty much being bored will get you in trouble in my book. I can imagine. And so what made you make the cat the one that's trying to work with the zombies? Because <laughs> it would be so I mean, much more fun. the world anyway. Let's not give them full credit while we're at it. So as you go through this story, you find out it's an interesting thing because she can communicate with the cat. Nobody else can. So this cat has, she did a horrible spell trying to become, make this cat her familiar. So and gave the cat more power than she intended to, let's be honest. That was never her master plan. So you find out this is a literally 75-year-old cat with an attitude who has a lot of powers that shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those, how much fun can you have and go a little crazy? So you get a, you get the Sylvia, you also get urban fantasy in there, and she's a bunch of mis madness, as much action as you can think. Now, like I said, you write from a different perspective than we do, obviously. How did this, how do you write from that perspective? Because you don't even have anything to, to even remotely lean on. I mean, you know what I mean? The one thing you can always do for dystopia is, you know, you're basing it on most of the time our universe. So you're basing on the knowledge you have of the everyday affair. And then start thinking in terms of in pictures you have seen of the devastation behind a war 
you know, mm-hmm. what does it look like? So my, my obsession lately is the fact that, you know, the grass, like in Texas, everybody wants to cut the grass. We are Olympic sports of cutting grass. What happens when you don't, you know, what does that start looking like? So for this dystopian world is everything falling apart. You know, they barely have electricity. They're trying to survive in whatever's left of that world that they knew. You know, they don't have television. They don't have any of those things. Think very third world country falling apart. Mm -hmm. You know, the streets are barely drivable. Food has to get planted. And then still trying to survive with a semi-functioning government that is still trying to control them. So technically, you take whatever you think this is and rip it apart. And dystopian mm-hmm. becomes really fun. Because then you got to explain why it happened. You know, what really now, happened and how we got there. Did your military background play any part in the dystopian versions of stuff going on? It did because it was a war setting. So I get to play with the whole concept of generals and soldiers. And mm-hmm. how does this whole entire backstory place into it? Since my little witch happens to be a general for her side. Mm-hmm. So she gets to have the militant behind, you know, and it's kind of, a retired military general that has nothing to do besides drink margaritas in her patio, <laughs> watch zombies walk around and watch her cat cut the grass with zombies. That's kind of the horror. Okay, can I be that general? Because that just sounds like fun. I mean, <laughs> watching your cat roll with zombies do. and margaritas and... That's what she does all day. Hang out and just drink, you know, margaritas and just sunbathe. What else does she have going on? Well, you know, there's, there's an, a, a zombie world apocalypse thing going on. You know, that's it. That's all that's going on. So what else do you write? Because you write, you write more than just the dystopian. You also write um, devotionals, Christian devotionals. Can you tell us a little Mm -hmm. bit about that and what it's like writing those? Anytime you take on nonfiction as a fiction writer, it's like opening up your soul. And I don't know how else to describe it. There is no safety net. There is no blanket. You know, for me, I write lots of books of cats and cats have magic and they talk mm-hmm. or I have talk, talking horses. There's always something that is safe that keeps it very much. There's a separation between my life and what I'm writing. When you're thinking of a nonfiction, especially when you're looking at a devotional, it is very open. It is very raw. It is very much what you point out to the universe and how authentic you can be. So you have to be able to say, I have walked this path, I have seen this path, I have researched this. So it becomes a journey of a lot of researching the scriptures, researching stories, anecdotes, and being able to provide that authentic journey for the person who does it. Because I got three devotionals, and they're each 28 days. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at somebody taking a 28-day journey with you. Every time I describe books to people, they kind of look at me kind of funny, but think about it. Like a book is the most personal relationship you have with anybody. Like you take your books to, you know, to bed, right. you know, we travel with these things, you know, you and this author had this entire commitment with each other, whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. So it becomes quite personal. Mm-hmm. So uh, devotion is, is you letting the reader go on their journey and hopefully walking them through that. So a little bit harder than writing about, you know, cast. <laughs> zombies <laughs> exactly now yeah. you also have other things that you write too the crazy cat lady can you tell us what that's about I, i'm seeing like a sense of a theme going with this cat thing how many cats do you actually have <laughs> i only have one that's the funny part <laughs> i have one cat that's it's his it. name constantine it could be he's that evil he could be constantine sometimes <laughs> no his name is chincha definitely not constantine so let me give you the backstory. So you ask how stories come about. Like usually my stories, I either have a scene that pumps into my head and then I have questions. For Cat Lady, I actually was coming from Baton Rouge on a mission. I was like, da-da-da, it was a romance convention. I don't write romance. And I really wanted to be part of this group. I was like, I should write a romance. This would be amazing. Like everybody does it. Mm-hmm. Romance is a little harder than I thought, especially for somebody who writes a lot of action. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I can make this happen. So this idea of a woman sitting in her living room contemplating, and it starts very dark because she's contemplating suicide. You know, she hit rock bottom. And my goal was to do a second chance story. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted her to find herself, to find love. Somehow she ended up becoming an arms dealer. And I'm like, that didn't work out how I thought. But it's a fun (laughs) at all. So now that you know it's supposed to be a romance, people are like, that didn't work out. I was like, no, not even close. 
but it's a really fun story of her finding herself, rediscovering her family, building a really good tribe of insane little ladies who were running around selling guns, and they're all over the age of 45. So it's great. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. Well, I'm a multi-genre author as well, and same as you. So one thing people, when I first started writing, I had an author friend, and she said, I usually write romance, but I want to write paranormal. Should I change my author name? And I said, no. And she's like, but my people are used to this. I said, do you ever pigeonhole an actor or an actress in one specific genre? And they can't come out of that unless they change their name. And so that I'm a big proponent for authors being multi-genre authors. I'm one, you're one, because you actually also have children's books out there. And not many people know that because your other, your big people books are a little more, you know, fluent. And that's the same with me. It's like sometimes people know of one or the other. They don't know that I'm both. And so being a multi-genre author, um, how did you feel jumping into it? It's a little bit more difficult. Like anybody who's listening or watching and is interesting in publishing and marketing, this is a huge decision that has to be personal. For multi-genre, marketing is complicated and it's very, very hard because you don't have people following you from one series to the other to the other. You know what I mean? I have people that love my urban fantasies and could care less about the children's and the devotionals and vice versa. So when you're looking at this world and you decided, okay, how am I going to pick? My business is based on my brand. So you're going to find quirky. You're going to find crazy. You're going to find action. There's going to be some explosion. Something's going to blow up in these books. And it's going to be high impact. So I focus on creating a brand and not so much the genre. Mm -hmm. For people who are starting out and looking to build that readership and truly decide that I want you to carry from one side, sticking to one genre is amazing. It, it works really well. <clears throat> With that in mind, if I ever decided to write erotica, which I will probably suck at it, I would definitely need a different pen name. Mm -hmm. Just because Charlie cannot hang out in the same universe and Charlie's yeah, no. children's book. No, sometimes so, um, they can float in between the universes, but something like that is just a little too far the other side. Right. And those are the things every writer has to look at in terms of what fits them, what mm -hmm. makes sense to them. If your books from one genre to the other have completely so much indifference, you know, I getting ready to do another urban fantasy with one of my characters. And this one has a little bit more steam than one people used to for me. There's still no sex, you know, the cursing is to a minimum, give or take. But I have to be very conscious that what the brand is supposed to be in order for people who pick up Charlie are not going to be devastated if they pick up, you know, Angela. So I do try to be specific to let them know, you know, it's meant for different audiences. Mm -hmm. You know, my Angela fans and cat lady are not interested in urban fantasy and that's okay. But mm -hmm. it becomes a brand, but it also has to be very oriented to what people are comfortable if they're looking for a readership that's going to follow them, definitely pick a genre and go crazy with it and see what happens. Yeah. When I'm teaching new authors, and Mike was included in this when I was teaching him marketing and stuff, I teach them to brand to the author, not to the series, not to mm -hmm. the books. So, for example, my tagline is, while the stories are fiction, the journey is real. I've been able to loop that in with Chief and Sarge as well because I started off as a big people author. But I was able to loop that in because, you know, Chief and Sarge go on journeys. They go on adventures. And I'm still able to loop that in. <laughs> if I were to something to go into the far side of the world, then, yeah, I might have to change it out. But for the most part, I just explain to them that I tell people I'm a Christian fiction author, but it's not your mama's Christian fiction. I'm going to tell you that right off the bat. You know? So, so DC, on, uh, on apocalyptic novels that you write, uh, there is a distinction there. Well, you mentioned dystopian. Dystopian is considered apocalyptic, but traditionally other apocalyptic novels like The Stand by Stephen King, uh -huh. uh, Pat Frank's The Last Babylon, uh, Cormac McCarthy, The Road, those would not be considered, I wouldn't think, of the dystopian genre. So, um, so how do you distinguish between the uh, apocalyptic novels that you write that are, you know, dystopian as uh, compared to those who might be more traditionally in a strict apocalyptic sense. And one of, one of the things I've noticed about dystopian novels 
is that they're very like the Hunger Games, for example. That's probably the best example. Uh, they're very nebulous on the origins of what happened. They start at the here and now. This is where the characters exist. So how do you approach your novels? Do you give a background on what happened or do you just take it from the story of the character at the particular time in your novels? With mine, and again, one of the biggest distinctions with mine is that mm. it has magic. So it's not just a world currently now that got destroyed and we're starting over there was an apocalyptic. I went a combination of apocalyptic dystopian with a whole bunch of urban fantasy. So that's usually the first disclaimer I have to tell people is that you're not just going to get a straight, you know, traditional one because of the magic. That's kind of what throw most people off since you don't see those versions of it. You know, you see in the world that has been destroyed and trying to come back. This one is definitely based on the destruction because of magic. What I do with them, I just tend to pick it up where you're going to find the characters. You will find out throughout the story how they got there. I will give you that background and pieces through conversations, through whatever that bubble they're going, but I'm not going to start with the whole, in the beginning, there was a war. You're not going to get that. Well, <laughs> you're just I mean, going to get... <laughs> traditionally, when you write a story, you want to hook them. If you start with this, uh -huh. you know, we do with that show, Don't Tell. And so if you start with it in the beginning, you're going to might lose them by the time you're finished even three or four pages into the thing. So you kind of got to start right in there. Well, it, it depends, I think, on whether or not you're narrating it as mm -hmm. you would a story that you're telling. In the case of Stephen King, the characters are living what's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and, and uh, where, where others, you know, like traditionally back in the 50s and 60s, uh, it would have been a nuclear war or wiped out the humanity, you know, that sort of thing. And people are picking them up, picking it up. But I like the, the magical aspect of it, DC, because that that's a real fantasy hook. And of course, you mm -hmm. know, you know, that's a lot of what I write. And I think that's, uh, I think that's something that you can, you can, even if you're not an apocalyptic reader, that mm -hmm. aspect of it is something that, you know, can attract readers that would ordinarily maybe not pick up an apocalyptic novel. Mm -hmm. The urban fantasy yep. aspect. Especially if magic is the cause of it. Right. That's, yeah. that's kind of being yeah. twist to it. Yeah. Right. So. It is definitely focused more on the urban side of the fantasy. So you have a very much urban fantasy which this happens to take place when the world has been destroyed, you know, so many years in the future. So you can do a combination. I don't mind crossing genres within the books themselves. I do tend to enjoy that. I, I add some thriller elements. I can do some mystery elements just because for me, magic and fantasy is so wide that you're going, okay, where am I grounding the story on? What is what I'm going to be using in order to truly be able to carry this for it or else I'm all over the place. And that's uh, Leroy the... asks an interesting question. Sorry, Mike. Um, how do you develop your magic system? Because each <laughs> each fantasy has like a certain, there are rules. There are guidelines. Mike, mm -hmm. you have them in yours. It's like, you know, how do you develop that? Where do you start? Our, I see when I go, do you want me to go? No. CJ, who are you talk, referring to? Either one. You guys oh, both well, have it. Well, the, the thing about the, apop the apocalyptic novels that DC is referring to, what I like about them, is you can start with a clean slate. You can make it whatever you want to. That's mm -hmm. why it's fiction. Mm -hmm. So if the old order is wiped out and the new order is in, you can make the new order whatever you like. The thing with fiction, I think whether it's, and I don't know what all, how you all feel about this, but the thing with fiction when you're writing it, uh, it is fiction, but it still has to be believable fiction. Mm -hmm. And it has to Agreed. make it has to, it has to be logical and it has to make sense. Mm -hmm. So you can build a fantastic world and it's awesome, except if it doesn't make sense to your readers because you haven't logically followed rules or parallels. The, the analogy I like to use is, uh, you know, we see a lot of people at Comic Cons. You know, CJ, we've been to several. Mm -hmm. Many of those people are huge into gaming, and mm -hmm. but games are based on they're basically books. They have characters. They have mm -hmm. rules. They have, uh, you know, they have a story that you follow. And uh, if you don't, you know, and, and those rules are embedded into the game that you have to follow if you're going to be successful or make it to the next level. But I do think you have to be believable. Uh, mm -hmm. and it has to make sense. 
DC, where do you start? For me, it's usually when I do urban fantasy, I start from the perspective that there is no magic or that my main characters are the no magic. So if you look at this intern, I, I'm going to introduce them to it. And what I try to do is pick aspects that people can recognize. So with death interns, we talked about the horsemen. You know, we all have an idea what the horsemen are, and then you can flip it. For magic, you have to definitely stay the rules of the game. You have to be able to let the readers know what to expect, what not to expect, what the magic can do. So anytime I'm introducing a new character, like I'm introducing vampires, no, they're not shiny and pretty. These ones are going to kill you. you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm, intru- I'm introducing demons. They're going to kill you too. You know what I mean? Anything that you're... So it is kind of that perspective that you. And they're not very nice. They're not nice about about it. They're just they're just not nice. No, they're not concerned about your feelings and emotions, Mm. and you're probably going to die. That's their Mm. mission. It's the same thing with the horsemen. Like besides death, everybody else wants to kill you. So (laughs) when you're looking at it, it is being able for the reader to to believe it. I had a person who loves the books. She's like, "This is not what my faith teaches me." I was like, "This is still fantasy, but okay, I'm I'm game." She's like, but I love the perspective, you know? So it is a, most fantasy readers tend to have a very open mind, but mm-hmm. you have to be able to let them know That's that, true. you know, if they're going yep. to, you know, Isis can see the dead. How did she see the dead? Well, according to death, you know, her third eye got open. So <laughs> I'm pulling a little bit from the chakras in there. You know, you get an opening chakras per se. I'm pulling a little bit of, you know, Christianity. And you get to pull the little things that people can kind of velcro to their belief system. And yet say, okay, if that got twisted, I can see that happening. And then just kind of slowly in every book, you push them a little farther along and see what happens. I mean, let's get real. If it's apocalyptic and you got zombies running around, pretty much (laughs) all the standard rules of the world are gone. (laughs) You can pretty much start (laughs) over. (laughs) With an apocalyptic, so this is kind of the fun part. When it comes to an apocalyptic, most of us are convinced that it is a horrible disaster happening we're going to end up being zombies because every movie we see says we're going to end up being zombies think about it every single new show is like we're all going to be zombies and we're going to die we're like oh mm-hmm. so- it's not going to be pretty it's like it's like half the time i'm watching stuff that's going on in the news and i'm like did you not see that movie did you not read that book what are you thinking we're all going to end up well, zombies even better just go read you know and web md it ends up in death so my toe hurts. Yeah, you're going to die. I'm like, who writes this medical fact? <laughs> so when you look, take a look at it. Next time you look, medical scroll fiction, to the bottom. And, always like, one. <laughs> and you're going to die. It always ends in death. I was like, oh, that's so exciting. So when you're looking at that, if you're able to add some magic to it, you have to explain exactly how you got there. But most of us are expecting to turn to vampires or, you know, zombies, and we're going to die. So then you can just run with it and give yourself that entire <laughs> world of madness. Hide behind the wall. Wall chainsaws. <laughs> I would like a couple of those. Uh, uh, <laughs> just funny. take your pick and zap their heads off. Yeah. That's usually how have they some do. Fun. <laughs> but the question but, is, <clears throat> when you take their heads off, do zombies actually die? Because they're already dead. So would their body not just walk around headless? Well, the rule so, is you have to shoot them through the head, right? If they don't kill them, isn't that the zombie rule? You've got. But aren't to shoot they already the dead? That's what <laughs> they I don't actually, understand. In theory, you kill the conscious side. So what you have is an animalistic being looking for food. So mm. if you watch Zombie Land, they like double tap because you know right. they might come back. Yeah. You're like, what's left? The rules. If you yeah. do, yeah. And if you do chop their heads, they're not coming back. There's nothing left. I mean, that one like chainsaws is looking so much better because you can just dismantle them all together. (laughs) Save yourself some headaches. And Leroy, uh, Rob Mays with, uh, Bob Mays with me. They are undead. And Leroy says, (laughs) are they dead? (laughs) It depends on your definition of death. Let's, Let's define it. If you as a human believe death has to have some conscious level, then yeah, they're dead or undead. So the right. one thing when it comes, yeah. don't take chances. No. Just hide behind the wall of chainsaws and just dismantle them all together, and they just never come back. Just I put them in different parts rifles. of the world. You know, get that magic. It's gonna be like a transporter. Dismantle them, just them. and put them all in different parts of the world. Just hope they don't good come back there. So my main character, she has enough magic that she can just snap her fingers oh. and they drop. Unfortunately, the cat doesn't appreciate it because he finds them to be his pets. He likes zombies better than humans. So they have an ongoing battle between the two of them. <laughs> it happens. 
Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Did you know? Go ahead, it's, Mike. It's funny because uh, World War Z, uh, which is both a book, uh, which actually it's a like a diary. If you've read the book World War Z by Max uh -huh. Brooks, it's kind of a diary on how it started and you know snippets of, of 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 how it progressed from that point. What I found interesting about it is that it was written by Max Brooks, who is Mel Brooks' son. You know, a comedian who you had never would have expected would have had the you know the zombie vibe you know and yet he's he wrote the book from which the you know you had the uh you had the movie i liked it was uh, such a good movie it was it was awesome i couldn't believe that's why i bought the book i couldn't believe it's short it's just a diary it's not really i don't know how they got a movie out of it but that so good. <laughs> to, to my one of my all-time favorite books all-time favorite books is stephen king's the stand and the reason mm -hmm. why it's my all-time favorite book is because it is a classic tale of good versus evil mm -hmm. which is you know in any genre uh, that 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 a, an author writes there's always going to be good versus evil and uh and i think that he did a particularly good job of of in the story of the stand which was an apocalyptic book of mm -hmm. ver evil versus good in a way that if you've never read stories, uh, you know, if you're not into apocalyptic, if you're not into, uh, you know, fantasy, whatever, it's still something that someone could read and, uh, and identify immediately, you know, because of the strong good versus evil. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but there's, <laughs> like I said, the Stephen the, King's uh, a little creepy. I'm going to admit it. He, he is. This is he's, one of the books he, he's, writ, he's he wrote earlier in, in his I career. Thought, yeah. I thought I had a twist in mind. His mind is like way beyond <laughs> twisted. <laughs> I'm just saying. But it's I, so much yeah. fun. It's so much fun. It is. So you gotta wonder. <laughs> so DC, do you have a strong good versus evil vibe in your in your novels? I guess it depends. Like some ones are more like who is the least of evils of all of them, if that makes any sense. Because some of the topics come up. I have a woman selling arms illegally. Is that really good or evil? That's some question marks. Sorry, so we were more... just talking about zombies and you said selling arms illegally. I thought, literally, <laughs> is she selling arms? Oh. <laughs> this is what I do on the side. This is my side gig. Sorry. So, wanna... <laughs> so it's a relative you know, scale. Really... It's a relative yes, scale. It is, definitely, <laughs> it is definitely relative of what you're looking at. I usually focus more, my themes more or less is family, give or take. You know, the definition of family and searching for family and searching for yourself. Good and bad can depend on the story. There's no Nobody's really good and nobody's really evil. There's a whole bunch of shades in between. Right. So it makes it a little bit more cryptic than most people are used to, you know, because when you read the urban, you know, the interim diaries, you know, they hang out with the devil and then she still questions that you're like, uh, who's really good? Who's really bad? And who do we, who makes that distinction? So mine are a little bit more up to your interpretation. Let me put it that way. I like putting in twists that people do not expect. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, what what can I put in here? Half the time it's the characters that come up with it. But it's like when they're when they're coming up with it, it's <laughs> I know I said they come up with it. When they're coming up with it and you're putting it in there, sometimes you kind of feel like the the evil genius monster going, ha, 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 I'm in control <laughs> of this. And you're really not, the characters are, but you know rules are rules and you just don't go against the character of the character and they come up with some pretty interesting stuff not gonna lie it's it's pretty cool um Leroy wants to know what about zombies that are healed how does that work i normally Heal. don't have them i normally don't have them healed they just kind of either are moving or not so I, actually i take it back i do have a whole zombie book that actually zombies get healed so book two on plague unleash it was bad viruses per se, and people were turning into zombies. And the goal was not to kill them, because if you kill them, they lost their souls. So basically you like knock them out and put them on the comatose stage so somebody can find a cure for that. So I guess depending if you're going to, they were technically not dead, they were just not human, I guess. So with that, I needed to come up with a- Transition? In between, there were kind of, yeah. So and here's my zombie story because I thought, I was like, my zombies are so nice. I tell my brother, he's like, you got five-year-olds attacking people. They're not nice. I was like, oh. I was like, 
I have a whole scene in a playground where these little kids go ballistic. I thought it was hysterical. My brother's like, that's intense. Like, you, you got little kids fighting people. That's just intense. I'm like, you should have told me that before I wrote that scene. But it's yeah, no, though, But that scene might turn out to be the best thing ever. You never know. It is so, funny. It is. Well, you got little has, kids going crazy. It has been a treat to talk to you. We are at our half, half hour mark time. Um, Mike, is there anything you'd like to add? Oh, it sounds your your novel sound fascinating, DC. Uh, uh, where I guess you posted where you can where we can get DC's novels. Mm -hmm. I have her website. It's posted mm -hmm. in the chat, and it's across the bottom of the screen right now. And and I'm assuming that uh, Amazon ebooks, mm -hmm. uh, paperbacks. Do you have any audio books? Is what any of them? We're working on that. Okay, we're working on that. And that is the goal for the next six months is to start doing some audio books. Okay. Yes. Nice. Well, DC, do you have any last words? Yes. AJ, Mike, it's always a pleasure. I am so thankful you guys invited me. I love hanging out. love talking to you guys. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for <laughs> thank coming you. on. And thank you for kind of filling us a little bit in. And those who are readers, you know, kind of the back the back side of what that looks like. And you might have picked up some new readers. Right. Uh, if you guys are out there, make sure to take a look at her books. You can find her at DC Gomez, G-O-M-E-Z dash author dot com. Well, next week, we're going to have a Christine Hall from Lone Star Literary Lit talking blog tours. So we'll see you all next week. Until then, find a good book and enjoy the escape.